Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us for the closing session as we wrap up what I think has been a very, very interesting and successful annual conference. So thank you for making it that way. Um, to begin is one of our favorite activities of the year, and that is to celebrate some of our general and artistic director colleagues who are enjoying anniversaries at their home companies. Uh, at this conference, we have one such general director uh, in attendance. And uh, we do this because all year long you are busy supporting the artists who are on stage, who take curtain calls, who enjoy applause. But the staff back at the office, the general and artistic directors frequently um, aren't celebrated in the same way despite their dynamic leadership throughout the year and over the years. Uh, this is our opportunity to celebrate our own and to say congratulations for a job well done. Today we get to do it to someone who is a favorite of many of ours. She is a stage director, travels around the country. She is a teacher who coaches some of the most exciting young artists today. She leads an opera company in Portland, Maine. She is our good friend, Donna Vaughn. We salute you on your 10th anniversary at Port Opera. Donna Vaughn is also my next door neighbor <coughs> on 84th Street. Uh, it's nice to see you. We never see one another on 84th Street. Um, there is another special award that we really want to draw your attention to uh, this year. And this is a, a special one. Uh, Irving Gutman, who is seated down here in the front row, is someone who is incredibly celebrated and well-known in Canada. And he's not as well-known in the United States. And we want to salute him, uh, but want to first tell you a little bit about his extraordinary achievement. Irving was born in Ontario, uh, went to school in Montreal and in Toronto, uh, and made his stage directing debut in May of 1953 in Cornwall, Ontario, with Minotti's The Consul. Uh, at that time, it starred the very young and soon-to-be great artist Maureen Forrester. That same year, he directed a complete Faust, the first of some 65 operatic programs for the CBC TV over the next six years, including many complete operas for uh, L'Air du Concert, a program of the CBC. Uh, he directed in 1956 The Marriage of Figaro at the Montreal Festival, and in 1958, he made his U.S. debut conduct, uh, directing in Santa Fe the world premiere of Carlisle Floyd's Wuthering Heights. After working as a guest director with New, uh, New Orleans Opera, Baltimore Civic Opera, Fort Worth Opera, Houston Grand Opera, all this in the late 1950s through 1960, he became the founding artistic director of the Vancouver Opera, which he served from 1960 to 1974. Uh, his debut at the Canadian Opera Company was directing La Traviata in 1964. And in 1965, Irving became the artistic director of the Edmonton Opera, a position he retained in 1991, until 1991. Uh, he produced uh, the Faust for Expo 67 and has been a guest director with the San Francisco Opera, Opera Philadelphia, was directed in Barcelona and in numerous Montreal festivals. Uh, he became artistic director of the Manitoba Opera Association in 1977. He has a long relationship as well with Calgary Opera. Many people consider Irving to be the father of opera in Canada, the father of opera certainly in Western Canada, as he was a founding artistic director or early artistic director in the lives of Vancouver Opera, uh, Edmonton Opera, Calgary Opera, Manitoba Opera. He was named a member of the Order of Canada in 1988. There's a wonderful interview uh, that he gave um, some years ago, and I have a transcript of it. I just want to read one paragraph. He was an early childhood friend of Terry McEwen. Uh, they grew up together. And uh, they were in grade nine, as this story goes on, and these are Irving's words. We'd fallen in love with opera together, you know, in our own way, and we listened to all these recordings and all that. 
One summer, we saved our money. We worked at a record store, I'm not sure, at something anyway, and we made about a hundred bucks. I worked, my, fa my father was in the construction business at the time, answering the phone and whatnot at the construction site, and I earned, as I say, about a hundred dollars. Uh, we decided to go to New York for the Christmas holidays and see opera. Well, with $100, we took the train. With $100, we took the train from Montreal to New York. We had a hotel for, I think, it was $10 a night or something. We ate, we ate at Needix, which was one of those places where you put 25 cents in and out comes a piece of pie or a sandwich, and we were so excited about that. But we bought the best seats at the Met, and in those days, I think seven or eight dollars got you the orchestra, and ten dollars in the first boxes. So we saw, he says, oh my God, we saw Lawrence Melchior and Astrid Varna in Townhauser. We saw Risa Stevens in Carmen. Uh, Don Giovanni with Zinka Milanoff in Ezio Pinza. It was incredible. Traviato with Lucia Albanese and Jan Pierce. We were so excited. We were on a high every night. Then we'd go have a little, go to a little cafe where we had coffee and donuts, you know, to get the excitement out of our system. And it was really something. This was a ninth grader who had saved his money to go to the Met and a fellow who then became the father of opera in Canada. I have a slideshow uh, because of the many, many places that Irving directed and uh, the young artists he had a chance to work with. We thought we'd assemble some and show you these marvelous pictures. Let me see if I can get this to work. Yes. You'll recognize a lot of these marvelous artists, Phyllis Curtin. These are early pictures from Wuthering Heights. Larry, this is not advancing very well. Can you, can you advance it from there? Renata Tivaldi, of course. All of these artists who were directed by Irving. It's amazing how many of these artists made their Canadian debuts early on, because Joan Sutherland's North American debut was here in Vancouver, directed by Irving. In Norma, and who was the Adel Giza? Marilyn Horn, Joan Sutherland, Norma, here in Vancouver. Great John Vickers. So it's an it's a storied career. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> Irving, it is with our great respect and gratitude for all that you have done for opera in this great country for all of the great artists you worked with early and well into their careers, for your work across the border in the United States with new works and established repertoire. We are so grateful for your contribution to opera. And on behalf of Opera America and Opera CA, Jim and I are delighted to present you with this plaque. With that, I'm going to turn the program to our chairman, Fredo Lindemann. Good morning, everyone. I'm supposed to say good morning. <laughs> <laughs> I want to note the particular contribution made by Opera Volunteers International to the world of opera and to our opera conference. And at this time, I'm pleased to introduce 
OVI's board president, Julie Benson. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, one thing I would like to say, a few people have asked uh, about the silent auction uh, that we have displayed in the lobby. And first of all, I would like to thank everyone uh, who contributed to the silent auction. The funds raised uh, for our silent auction will be used for grants, hopefully for your company to further advance opera in your community. Um, on, and also, I was asked to announce that the silent auction will be closing at 11 o'clock this morning. So if you have any bids out there, uh, we'll be wrapping that up at 11. On behalf of Opera Volunteers International, I want to thank you, thank you, thank you to Mark Skorka and Opera America um, for the superb planning and the attention to detail. The uh, Hyatt Hotel, which they chose, has been a perfect venue, and the sessions uh, that Opera America have planned have been uh, well thought out and informative. And um, we've shared so many great ideas to bring back to our communities, and um, a couple of them we talked about uh, doing more to, uh, uh, to well, do more, do more to participate in the National Opera Week. Uh, we've talked about trying to bring more children into volunteering for opera within the community. And we've also talked about uh, putting together an app for volunteering for opera. So uh, there are many, many ideas that come out of the conference, and uh, we have to thank Opera America for all the sessions. Um, the city they chose, uh, Vancouver, has been uh, absolutely fantastic, and even the weather was perfectly planned. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Also thanks to uh, Jim Wright and the Vancouver Opera for hosting. Uh, the boat trip was absolutely fantastic. The opera has been wonderful. And um, all in all, Out of Bounds has been an overwhelming success. The opera volunteers, I believe, have gained uh, new appreciation for the companies and for the artists uh, that are here. And um, we are hopeful that the opera companies and the artists have gained a new appreciation for opera volunteers. So beyond, uh, on behalf of Opera Volunteers International, um, thank you, and we look forward to seeing all of you in San Francisco. Thank you, Julie. Can you hear me? It is a great pleasure for me to acknowledge the important partnership between Opera America and Opera CA. Opera CA has been deeply involved in planning this conference, and we are delighted, aren't we? To thank them, we are. We're delighted to thank them, and to I'm delighted to introduce the general director of Pacific Opera Victoria, and the board chair of Opera CA, Patrick Corrigan. Um, on behalf of the Opera Companies of Canada, I just want to say how proud and delighted we are that, to have the conference north of the border this year. And in that regard, we all thank uh, Vancouver Opera and Jim Wright for a job so absolutely beautifully done and for representing us so proudly. Thank you so much, Jim. <laughs> Some of you may not know that we took two days before the conference to hold our colloquium for Opera CA and the purpose of that colloquium was to spend two days to work um, on co-production artistic collaboration across the country. This was extraordinarily productive. As well, we also had another session where 15 board members from across Western Canada came together to look at how they can work together, not just for their companies, but as well for the sector. This was very productive as well. Uh, but you know, when I think about the big takeaways of a conference, I think it's always about the relationships that we create and what we learn from and about each other. I think we are extraordinarily fortunate to be in a profoundly collaborative and collegial sector. And that so much learning that's critical to our endeavor comes from our brothers and sisters at Opera America. In our opening remarks, uh, Chairman Freda Lindemann instructed all the directors to reach out and talk to the new and young members as they may not be as confident and as experienced in their fields. 
and I was pleased to see so many new and young people at the conference this year. I applaud Opera America for giving us all the opportunity to grow and to learn, and I wish to thank Opera America again this year for offering group price incentives that allows companies like mine the opportunity to bring bigger teams to conference and thus multiply the benefit the conference brings to our company and to our partnerships. I want to talk about that. Thank you. At the 2013 conference, we were reminded at several points that so much leadership lies just beyond the discovery and acceptance of what we don't know. We were reminded that innovation is a learned practice that must become a core strength of our sector if we are to thrive in these times of precipitous change. We were reminded that the Opera House is a place to celebrate our unique and diverse communities. And we learned that to create access for new people, we must let go of our sense of expertise and open the dialogue and enterprise fully to those we hope to engage. Just these few issues should keep us busy up until the next conference in San Francisco. Finally, I want to acknowledge the incredible team at Opera America. You always welcome us so warmly. You're always so prepared, so helpful. And this leadership really sets the tone for the conference and the benefit we reap from it. I have the privilege to be a guest at the Opera uh, America board meetings. I see firsthand how extraordinarily hard everyone is working to support the field and support each of us as we're out there fighting for this art form. In this regard, I wish to say that as they support us, let us consider carefully how we might support them. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Patrick. It is a pleasure to work with Opera CA and all of our Canadian colleagues uh, who are in, just incalculably, indescribably polite and courteous and welcoming. Uh, we really learn from you and appreciate what you bring to our table. Uh, it is an honor to introduce our closing keynote speaker. Every time I encounter David Gockley, I am awed again about his brilliant insight into the condition of the field, his vision for the art form, and his art ability to articulate both. David is a true leader. He's been a leader of our field for decades, and I say that not to date him, but to say how long his visionary leadership has benefited all of us. Uh, we have been hosted by David at various conferences over the years. He was the board chairman of Opera America for two terms. Um, he is a great colleague, and I ask you to join me in thanking him for all he's done for Opera and for welcoming him this morning. Thank you, Mark, and good morning. Uh, I have to say I'm in shock to see so many people here at the end of a conference. Uh, uh, I had expected um, a situation like, like uh, we used to encounter uh, back when I was the chairman of uh, Opera America. By the time we got to this point in the week, there were you know, a few stragglers here, staff members, et cetera. So bravo to you for creating a, uh, a program that is so rich uh, and obviously so interesting right up to the final wire. And I, I had a story prepared, uh, which, which is totally inappropriate uh, for the, the circumstances, but I'm going to tell it anyway because my talk is not that long. That'll take half of it. <laughs> uh, when I got to San Francisco, I was, I was asked to give a uh, talk, a lakeside talk at the Bohemian Grove. And, uh, oh boy, uh, it was a Sunday afternoon lakeside talk. I said, prime time. And, and so I put a lot of effort into crafting my remarks because I knew I was going to be staring down Henry Kissinger, Colin Powell, Clint Eastwood, these kinds of people. And so I, w I was ready. I had my cards and walked up to the, uh, the lake. And uh, at that point, I was like just minutes before I was to start. And uh, I said, where are the people? There were about, you know, 40 uh, individuals there, and some of them were squirrels. 
And some guy said, didn't they tell you most of the people go home Sunday morning? <laughs> so I was going to recycle those remarks here today, but, I, but now I won't. I, I figured I had to use them before some huge group at some point, but uh, uh, I will not. And my, my purpose for being here is uh, uh, to... And I will get to that. We welcome you to San Francisco next uh, June for the f- conference. Uh, and, and also to give you a sense of what we might be getting at at that conference in terms of uh, material uh, and uh, uh, areas to investigate and to add value to all of the work that we do in our respective cities and also in a macro sense of for opera as an art form around North America and beyond. I of course want to acknowledge, as we all have, Jim Wright and his staff here at Vancouver Opera for providing us uh, a magnificent experience here. You have been superb hosts. And Mark and Opera America's staff for your tireless commitment and energy over the last week. It's not easy to turn out these conferences year after year with new materials and angles. As an old-time Opera American, I, I really marvel at the extent and diversity of the membership, the richness that exists at these conferences, how Mark and his staff use technology and the internet to inform and educate us throughout the year, and of course, the Opera Center, which shall remain a monument to Mark's vision and resolve. He simply willed it into existence. I now want to invite you formally to the 2014 annual conference in San Francisco, the first one in the city by the bay since 1988. Uh, I was chairman uh, during uh, 1988, and uh, we had the conference at the Fairmont Hotel. And if you ever uh, knew or know the Fairmont Hotel, it is this very, very voluptuously designed, uh, you know, kind of Rococo uh, decor hotel. And uh, I will never forget uh, being put up in like the presidential suite of the uh, Fairmont with, with like three or four different rooms and the decor and the chandeliers and the sconces and and all of all of the uh, glamorous uh, surroundings and uh, I have to say we're not going to be there uh, (laughs) (laughs) where are we going we're at the Hyatt again on (laughs) Union Square and the great part of that is you're right in the heart of the city uh, all the shopping area. There are museums and some theaters and and, and eateries and and bars and it, it is San Francisco, the core of uh, San Francisco, as opposed to being up on uh, Knob Hill. Uh, I invite you not only in behalf of San Francisco Opera, but on behalf of the seven other member companies of. Opera America that are located in the Bay Area. They are Opera Parallel, Opera San Jose, Festival Opera, West Edge Opera, the Paul Drescher Ensemble, Golden Gate Opera, and Livermore Valley Opera. This area of the world is a veritable hotbed of opera activity. Aside from the eight members of Opera America, there are another 22 non-members of Opera America that we hope to recruit, right? (coughs) And uh, 
they include uh, First Look Opera in Sonoma, Pocket Opera, which is well known for many, many years, and indeed, Waffle Opera. And it's true, at intermission, they serve waffles. <laughs> and don't think they're any kind of a, you know, the, that the art is not important. Also, uh, last December, they resurrected the early 19th century opera, Cendrillon, not by Massenet, but by the Maltese composer, Niccolo Isoard. Now, how many have heard of Nicola Isoard? Waffle Opera has. <laughs> uh, but there, the, the amount of repertoire, the diversity of repertoire that's available uh, in the Bay Area for a short drive, I mean, uh, it's amazing. Now, what will San Francisco be up to during that particular period of time? We will be presenting three operas in our usual summer repertory. We will be presenting Butterfly with Reset, Traviata with a, a new Bulgarian sensation, uh, Yonsheva, uh, and Showboat with Nathan Gunn and Heidi Stover et al. Uh, it's obviously a more popular repertoire than I would have hoped for to showcase the company, given the company's rep reputation, but <coughs> a number of things, including budget and a, a hammer, a board of directors hammer over my head, uh, caused uh, these particular operas to be at this particular time. I, I talked to Mark once those decisions had been uh, uh, urged upon me, and. Uh, the, uh, uh, I said, couldn't we do the next year? And, and Mark said, I, I'm sorry, all the, d the, the deals at the Hyatt have been signed, sealed, and delivered. Uh, so you come, and wh wh what are we going to do? We're going to hopefully have a ballpark simulcast uh, during that period of time. Uh, we won't know until Major League Baseball comes out with their schedule in September, but there's a greater than 50-50 chance that that one of the dates in that week will uh, be available. And I'm I'm praying because if there's anything that will give all of us the sense that opera is something for everybody and that opera thrills, it's that. Uh, it's, those have been some of the most amazing experiences of, of my career and some of the most encouraging ones. Um, we will show off our media capability and describe how we have structured union rights agreements to exploit various media outlets and develop relationships with local and regional cinemas and local and regional public television stations. Uh, heaven knows it's not the Met, uh, but maybe it is more within the realm of possibility for smaller companies wanting to make a media impact in their region of influence. And any way we can be of help to that, uh, our media suite will be uh, on display. and. Uh, I thought that it might be interesting because the, the, the equipment that is coming uh, available is lesser and lesser expensive and uh, to have various levels of video capability on display by manufacturers and suppliers might, might uh, be helpful to launch companies into their own uh, media activity. Uh, the Merola Opera program will be in full swing, and I'm sure uh, if it's the will of this group to hear auditions of the, um, as we call them, the, the Merolini, uh, we'll be happy to, give, uh, to arrange that for you. <coughs> uh, then there are our other companies uh, around uh, 
the Bay Area. And notwithstanding the lack of uh, performance spaces, uh, the, even the Herbst Theater next door is closed for seismic renovation uh, next summer. So that is out as an alternate performance space. But we're going to work with Opera Parallel and uh, some of the other opera companies who are members of Opera America and try to facilitate some of their work in the city uh, to, to have options uh, to go to that, that uh, showcase these wonderful uh, groups that we have uh, in our area. Mark has suggested a conference theme of audiences reimagined. Re reimagined. I think what he's getting at is some of these answers to some of these questions. How do we keep our houses full in the post-subscription era? How do we efficiently market single tickets? How does this phenomenon, this post-subscription phenomenon, inform repertory decisions. And to some extent, it informed the repertory decision that led to these three popular operas being done at San Francisco in uh, June of 2014. Uh, we, we needed the operas, we, we needed, we need to do 90%. And in order to, to do 90%, subscri subscription has less of a part of that. And, and maybe, maybe you have uh, also had this phenomenon in your company. But if you compare uh, the early 1980s uh, to now, San Francisco had 80%, was 80% subscribed with uh, both mostly fulls, but we had gone to halves at that point. <coughs> and now we are 45% subscribed, and we have trios and quartets and design your own and, you know, throw up the brochure, and if it comes down one way, that's what you choose. Uh, but uh, we're, we, are, uh, we are struggling to get people to subscribe. And uh, that, of course, has, has a number of uh, ramifications. You, you then have to fill uh, seats with more popular works. Uh, when you had subscription, you could hide certain pieces of wonderful things within a subscription. Now they're out there dangling on their own. And uh, that's fine and dandy. But uh, if, if, you, if you need 90% to make your budget and six performances of Mac Macropolis will do only 70, then you've got to make up for it on the other end by having uh, uh, you know, a couple that are very close to 100. So uh, in this context, how can we not be compromised as artistic entities having to be more market-driven, as it were. How do we get these more casual attenders engaged enough to become subscribers, volunteers, donors, and bequeathers? How do we get people on track to making the mega gifts that are required for an art form of this scale and complexity. But can we imagine audiences without reimagining the whole opera experience, including, of course, repertory, performance length and, and scale, <coughs> venue diversity and amenities? We're working at this point to, uh, to find some kind of a solution for interactive seatback devices that will get one into, uh, you know, ordering drinks, uh, re 
renewing subscriptions, uh, doing uh, a number of different things, uh, including in, in education. Uh, and maybe we'll have some more of the results of that work uh, on view um, next June. Uh, high impact communications, like video teasers coming over uh, the web. Educational op opportunities with social components. Communications methods that bring audience members closer together and closer to the organization. A veritable social network on speed. What will it mean to attend opera 10 years from now? How do we adapt to ever-changing lifestyles and entertainment media? When are drinks going to be brought into the, to the auditorium? Sooner than we think. And, and that, that is, it, it probably is a long-range positive, but it will be a short-range, uh, uh, really, uh, difficulty. I don't, I don't know whether waters, you, you allow water to be brought into the theater. That seems to be the first barrier uh, of, uh, you know, what is to come. Um, what is sac sacrosanct about our art form and what is adaptable? How can we anticipate the kinds of labor agreements we will need to do the programming that we will have to do? And how can all of you avoid what San Francisco Opera has gotten, in, gotten itself into in the last 30 to 40 years uh, with regards to guarantees and tenures and all of the things that, that, that kind of tend to admire us in the latter part of the 19th century in terms of what, what our instrument is uh, to produce opera. We, ha we, have, uh, we don't have a lot of flexibility uh, and maneuverability into the new age. And I would uh, encourage you to be, be very careful uh, what you agree to across the bargaining table, um, your bargaining tables as you go uh, forward and, and imagine the kind of opera that you will need choristers for or stagehands for, uh, orchestra members for, etc. San Francisco, of course, is a stone's throw from Silicon Valley. <coughs> and we have talked for years about a kind of Berlin Wall that exists somewhere south of San Francisco, and it's a them and us uh, phenomenon. Uh, young Steve Jobs types wearing hoodies and, and, and sitting in the lotus position uh, somewhere down there uh, doing a little pot smoking or maybe a lot of pot smoking. Uh, to, to some extent these guys have grown up. Uh, there is a permeability now in that wall uh, a lot of a lot of people who work down there are beginning to live in San Francisco, and want to enjoy the amenities of San Francisco because, you know, Palo Alto, aside from Stanford, is a pretty boring place to to uh, live. And we had, uh, you know, there, there's been this existential question: How do we involve involve uh, I, how do we involve this amazing brain power, you know, on our board, uh, on our committees, uh, et cetera? And uh, obviously some of them are quite wealthy, although the wealth may still be paper wealth rather than <coughs> cash wealth. And we, we have one board member Ben Nelson, he invented Snapfish, sold it to HP, uh, and now he's at work on a, uh, parenthetically, on an online university. 
which is supposed to rival the Ivy League schools. And he's recruiting a lot of, of talent for his uh, operation. <coughs> he said, I will lend you my, my head hunting firm and we will canvas the, the creme de la creme of Silicon Valley and find out how interested they are in opera as an art form and in participating with you uh, and maybe even joining the board and making a contribution, et cetera. And so I was saying, oh, God, you think that'll work? Uh, but lo and behold, out of that canvassing, we had, and, and maybe a hundred different uh, people were contacted. Some of them took meetings about it. And the, the, the result uh, is that 10 of them have shown up as major prospects for the board, uh, certainly uh, willing to look at what they can bring to us. Uh, they're, they're very interested in making a difference. They don't want to sit around meetings, you know, boring meetings. They want to, they want to make a difference. And <coughs> so we are organizing a task force which will meet at, in the next months. And we have asked Mark to facilitate that task force and uh, because he does it so well. And uh, we will deal with all the questions that I've posed uh, in the last couple of minutes. and. What comes out of that will determine and frame how we approach uh, the conference next summer, how, how we um, get these guys to speak to us, to you, uh, how, uh, how we structure the, uh, the discourse. And uh, I am hoping that the work that the opera is doing and that Mark will do with this group uh, will come up with something that is life-changing about how this thought process, how this creativity, so much of wor which is customer-driven, customer relations-driven, communications-driven, uh, will uh, benefit our particular form and uh, so that's that and by and you'll also uh, have the opportunity to uh, entertain yourself in one of the world's most exciting and beautiful cities So, I'm 
unlike Bohemian Grove, we really appreciate David Godfrey. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? <laughs> Unlike the Bohemian Grove, we really appreciate David Gockley coming and entertaining and inspiring us during the last gasp of this conference. <laughs> we needed it. We all look forward to San Francisco, and uh, it's going to be marvelous. Thank you, David. Jim, Jim Wright. For the thousand and one time, I'm going to say <laughs> thank you, Jim Wright, uh, not only Jim, but the Vancouver Opera Board and all their staff for hosting a fabulous conference. It really was, we'll never forget it. And again, thank you, Jim Wright. Thank you. Yay! Oh. Jim, thank you. We have a, a plaque for Jim that says, Bravo, with deepest appreciation, the members of Opera America extend their gratitude to the board staff and volunteers of Vancouver Opera for their exceptional support of Opera Conference 2013, uh, given today, May 11th, 2013. Now, Jim, has gotten one of these for his 10th anniversary and one of these for thank and Jim has a whole dinner service of, of, pla <laughs> of plaques from Opera America, but this is... I may need yours, Donna, later. With <laughs> <the table>. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. I have just a few brief remarks. I just want to thank everyone for attending. Uh, it's, it's been a real pleasure to, to host you, and I, I want to thank you for giving your time, giving your own or your organization's treasure, and sharing with us your talents uh, over this conference. Uh, we're very, very grateful. I want to thank the Vancouver Opera staff and volunteers and board, and of course the Opera America staff, which has been wonderful to work with, and, along with Christina, the Opera Volunteers International, the Board of Opera CA, thank you all uh, for allowing us this opportunity. We're very grateful. And I'm looking forward to renewing old friendships and new uh, next June in San Francisco. That was a, a marvelous talk, David, and, and very inspirational and very thought-provoking as, as always. And the video's great, and I can't wait to be there. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, Just in case, Mark, I have this natty umbrella for such a nattily dressed gentleman, just in case you need it on your way to the airport this afternoon. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. I'm glad to have the umbrella, even though I know you in Vancouver think rain is nice. Uh, so. We've come to a very important moment in the conference where we have a drawing for those who completed their exhibitor passport. And I think that's going to be Alexa and Kate, if you will please come up to do the honors. We have a um, completely certified process here. Uh, Deloitte audits our drawing. The person who wins this year's Kindle for going to every exhibitor and f completing the exhibitor passport is Iris from Fargo Moorhead. Thank you so much and congratulations. Would all the Opera America staff in the room, please rise. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for all you do for Opera America and for our members. Thank you.
I don't say it frequently enough, I don't say it nearly enough, how blessed I am, how blessed we are to have such a fantastic staff. Uh, I really mean that from, from the deepest places. Um, I'm going to turn it over for our final closing, final remarks to Freda. In short, for the last time, I'm going to say thank you. Thank you for attending this conference, and uh, I hope to see you all in on June 20th in San Francisco, beautiful home of San Francisco Opera, David Gockley, and my own daughter, so, <laughs> who's quite beautiful, by the way. Please come, and <laughs> please come and join us, and I wish you a safe journey home, and happy Mother's Day tomorrow. Thank you.